Okay, our study today is dealing with the subject of you are responsible. Now, is that a frightening thought? A what? I have grease on my face? Are you kidding? Well, that would be embarrassing. We're here on national television. It's international now, isn't it? That's right. We're going to Europe. Did you know that? And you're telling me here I am in front of all these people and I've got grease on my face? You know, before I come to every meeting, my personal hygiene is very thorough. I deodorize my armpits and gargle and brush. I even tape up my socks to make sure they don't fall down. See that? Sure hurts when you take the tape off, too. And now you're telling me I'm sitting here on TV and I've got dirt on my face? I don't see anything on my face. How are you going to convince me there's something wrong with my appearance? A mirror? Where am I going to find a mirror? What do you know? <laughs> Why is it always easier to see the dirt on someone else's face than your own? Have you noticed that? Oh my. Now, I felt just fine when I first stepped out here until I peered into this object. Obviously, this is the problem, right? I was feeling okay about myself until I looked in the mirror. Now the mirror has made me feel bad about myself. So the only thing to do is get rid of the mirror. Break it. Is that the answer? I feel much better now as long as I'm not looking in that. I heard about a man in China ordered a microscope from North America, started looking at everything, bugs and leaves and hairs. He made the mistake of looking at his rice. It was swarming with parasites. He decided he had to either get rid of the microscope or get rid of his rice, and he liked his rice, so he destroyed the microscope. <laughs> now, if this mirror shows me the dirt, it only seems fair it should also remove it. Doesn't that sound reasonable to you? Will it work? Didn't help. Now, wait a second. It shows me the dirt, but it doesn't take it away? What good is it? What do I do to, about my predicament? I still got the dirt. All this does is help me be aware that it's there. Anyone got any suggestions? Washcloth? Where am I going to find a washcloth? Same guy. That... It's interesting how this is just all falling into place, isn't it? Are you trying to tell me that a, a red cloth can take a black mark off a white face? That doesn't make any sense at all. Doesn't make any sense how the blood of Jesus can wash away sin either, does it? Well, I want to make sure that I get the right spot, so this thing may come in handy after all. You know, one time I did this illustration and I made the mistake of using a permanent marker. handsome character, eh? <laughs> Do you all get the point? The law does not exist. Our, our lesson tonight is on the law of God. The law does not exist for the purpose of taking away our sin. It was never intended to do that. The law is simply a reflection of God's will. It helps us be aware of our sin and then we go to Jesus for cleansing. Now friends, I need to tell you something. This lesson tonight is not going to be popular with some who are listening and also for our viewers on TV what I'm going to say is not popular even in Christian circles but it's true it's from the Bible and let me tell you what's going on the devil is attacking the law of God you know why because by the law is the knowledge of sin if you don't have a law you don't have a knowledge of sin where there's no law there's no transgression if there's no transgression there's no penalty if there's no penalty you don't need a savior by the devil attacking the law, he's attacking the very foundation for Christianity. You don't need Jesus if there's no sin and there's no law. You see what he's up to? The law doesn't take away our sin, but it helps us realize our need of Jesus. And so when people are saying we don't need the law anymore, 
Oh, that's a very dangerous doctrine. That is a doctrine of devils. Now, we're going to look at God's Word. Do we all agree to stick to the Bible, right? And if we stick with the Bible, we're safe. All right, let's go on. This is kind of an ominous title, You Are Responsible. But uh, it's true. We do have an obligation as God's children to find out what His will is and follow it. Question number one. Did God Himself really write the Ten Commandments? What's the answer? Absolutely yes. The Bible says, He gave unto Moses two tablets of the testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. And the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God on the tablets. What happened to the first transcript of the Ten Commandments that Moses received from God? Remember, he came down the mountain, they made a golden calf, Moses cast them out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. So what did God say? Well, I guess the law won't work anymore. Or did God say, cut out two more stones, bring them up, and I will write on them again the same writing as the first time? Both times God wrote. You know, there's only a few times in the Bible God writes anything. He wrote His law in stone. He wrote the judgment of Babylon. You've heard of the handwriting on the wall? In fiery letters on the wall. And Jesus wrote the sins in the dust. Aren't you glad that the law is written in stone, but the sin is only written in dust? When you write something in stone, what does that typify? You don't change something that's written in stone. That's what it means. It's still there, friends. Number two, what is the definition for sin? John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 is the best definition. It says, say it with me, it's right there in your lesson. Sin is the transgression of the law. Now, before I go on any further with the word law, we need to define that a little bit. The word law is used several times in several ways in the Bible. Sometimes the word law simply means the writings of the Old Testament. They sometimes call it the law, the five books of Moses. The word law sometimes was speaking of the ceremonial ordinance that was connected with the sanctuary and its services. And many times the word law meant the Ten Commandments. A rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, Good master, what good things should I do that I might have everlasting life? Mark chapter 10. Jesus said, Keep the commandments. He said, Which? And Jesus began to quote the Ten Commandments. And the man interrupted Jesus before he finished and said, Oh, I've kept all these from my youth up. Which he really hadn't. And so the law of God is the foundation of his government. Now there are several definitions for sin in the Bible. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is knowing to do good and not do it. You know, not only do you have sins that you commit, like when you murder somebody, but there are also sins of omission, when you omit. For instance, you can kill a person by running them over with your car. You can kill a person by seeing someone bleeding to death on the side of the road and driving by with your car and not stopping to help. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot more people in the lake of fire because of sins of omission they just fail to do. They say, well, I don't rob, I don't steal, I don't kill, I'm a good person. But they don't do what God wants them to do. So sin is also knowing to do good and not doing it. The Bible tells us further, anything that is not of faith is sin. In other words, if you've got doubts about something you're doing, it may be because it's wrong and your conscience is bothering you. Okay, so there's several definitions, but the clearest is sin is the transgression of God's law. Tonight when we speak of the law, we're speaking more specifically of the Ten Commandments. You'd be surprised... How often I have heard ministers say on TV and on the radio, well, they had the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, but we don't need that now because we're in the New Testament and we're supposed to keep the New Covenant, the New Commandments. The New Commandment is love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And I nearly choke with combined anger and laughter. Jesus, when he quoted the new commandment, when he says, a new commandment I give unto you, he meant a new concept because Jesus was quoting Moses. Who wrote the first books in the Bible? Moses wrote Genesis. How much older can you get? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Leviticus chapter 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was saying, this is a new concept for you. Now, well, let me go ahead here. Number three, why did God give us the Ten Commandments? I have so much to say. Why? To make us miserable and restrict our freedom. How many of you are parents and you have rules in your family? Are the rules in your family to restrict the happiness or to preserve and protect the happiness? 
I knew a mother in Texas. She lived in a mobile home. She heard a blast coming from the bedroom. Her heart froze in her chest. She had two toddlers in the house. She ran into the bedroom and the children had somehow managed to climb up into the closet and get a hold of their father's revolver that was loaded. They were like five and six years old and they shot it. She grabbed it and they started to cry. And instead of crying because of fear, they were saying, you don't want us to have any fun. That's how we are sometimes with God. She said, you're never to touch this again. Why? Because sin will kill you. That's what a parent says to their children. The reason God wants us to obey is because he loves us. And when we disobey, it hurts us. Happy is he. I'm sorry, he that keeps the law, happy is he. Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 3, verse 1 and 2. Keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add unto thee. How many of you want peace, long life, and length of days? Now, I told you I've been in jail several times before I was a Christian, never to visit. I was a resident. Once I became a Christian, I've only been to jail to visit. It's added a lot of peace to my life because God has changed my heart. Number four, why is God's law exceedingly important to me personally? Well, it tells us, so speak and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, are we saved by keeping the commandments? Huh? No. We're saved by grace through faith. Are we judged by our works? Yes. The Bible says you're saved by grace, but it's very clear. Jesus said everyone will be judged according to their works. They'll be rewarded according to their works. Jesus said by your fruits, by your works, you'll know them. If a person says, I'm a Christian, praise the Lord, and they're a serial killer as a side job, it doesn't matter what their profession is, their works say they're a liar. And the truth is not in them. That's what John tells us. Anyone who says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And there's a lot of people out there taking the name of Jesus in vain. They say they're Christians and they're disobeying God. Jesus did not die to, to buy us a license to sin. He died to prove that when he's in us, he can transform us and enable us to be different. And you'll never convince me otherwise. I shared my testimony last night. The devil had a firm hold on me. I used to drink and smoke and steal and lie and curse and God. And it didn't all happen in one day, so don't get discouraged. God's helped me quit smoking. Praise the Lord. It's so good. I haven't had a cigarette in my mouth in 18 years. He helped me quit drinking. He helped me quit cursing. He didn't help me just cut back. Christians just don't cut back a little bit. God sets us free. He wants to restore in you and me the image of Jesus. Amen? And that's what angels are waiting for. They want to see people who will have more faith that God can make them different. And I believe he can. Now, don't misunderstand. Pastor Doug is not boasting that God is finished with me yet. Christ is my standard, not you. And when I look at him, I see I have a long way to go. But when I look at how far he's brought me, I have faith he'll finish what he's begun in my life. So I don't live in fear from day to day. I still make my fair share of mistakes, but I see progress. I'm growing to become more like Jesus as I spend time in his word. Number five. Can God's law, the Ten Commandments, ever be changed or abolished? No. It's eternal. Jesus said, He that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who builds his house on what? Rock. What did God write the Ten Commandments on? Rock. What is another name for Jesus? The Rock of Ages. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. Now you're saying, Doug, how, how could you possibly equate the law with Jesus? Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God, yea, your law is within my heart. What is the will of God? You know, Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, who's going, Jesus? But they that do the will of my Father in heaven. They that what? That hear the will? That talk about the will? They that do the will of God. What is the will of God? says it right here. The law of God is the will of God. And does he say, I abhor, I am miserable about doing your will? He says, I delight. Now, that's the part that everybody fails. A lot of folks start thinking about the law before they have the love. The law is just going to irritate you until you have the love. 
You must first fall in love with the Lord or you will be powerless to obey Him. When the love of God through the Holy Spirit floods your heart, obedience becomes a joy. It's so different. That's what we need more than anything, is genuine conversion. If you wanted to do something temporarily, would you write it on stone? Would you write it with your finger? Would you speak it with your own voice? What more, please tell me, what more could God Almighty have done with the Ten Commandments that He did not do to impress us with its permanence? You know, in the Bible, they had the sanctuary, the holy place, and then the most holy place. How many of you have heard of the Ark of the Covenant? Everyone talks about this golden box, and they've made movies about people in search of the golden Ark of the Covenant, as though the treasure was the Ark. The golden box was there to contain some rocks inside. The greatest honor on earth was bestowed upon the temple of God and the most sacred part of the temple was the Holy of Holies and the only thing in there was a golden box and the only thing in the golden box there on earth was the will of God written with His finger. Now for Christians to say that's not important anymore, oh, we've come to a dark day indeed, friends. We're the ones who should be presenting God's will to the people. As you preach and talk about God's law, as you lift up the law, people will be aware of their sin. And nobody wants to feel bad. But you know what? Before you come to Jesus for cleansing, you've got to feel bad. Jesus doesn't want you to stay bad. He doesn't want you to, make, uh, to wallow in guilt. But He wants you to realize you've got a problem, so you'll come to the foot of the cross for cleansing. We're in an age now where we're being told by all the, the secular psychology that you know, guilt is bad. Don't feel guilty. How many of you that have children would be comfortable if your child is caught shoplifting and when you confront them they say, hey look, don't put any guilt on me. You know, I couldn't help myself, nobody's perfect. Would you start to worry if they had that attitude? How many of you would be refreshed if they said, I'm sorry, I don't know what came over me, I don't want to ever do this again. Wouldn't that be encouraging if they had remorse? You've got a whole generation that is being taught we're not supposed to feel bad about doing bad. Well, God's law is supposed to help us realize we've got dirt on our face and then we go to Jesus to be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? We need the law. The devil is attacking it because he takes away, by taking away the law, he takes away our need for Christ. He takes away the mirror where we don't see our sin. Don't see the sin, you don't need a Savior. The most pathetic thing, though, is pastors are telling people this. I'll get into that just a little more. Let me tell you how I really feel. Just kidding. Number six. <laughs> Did Jesus abolish God's law while He was here on earth? Turn with me in your Bibles to 1402. That's Matthew chapter 5. I want, I want to read it from the words of the Lord. Why don't we start with, well, I'll start with verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's talking about letting your light shine. Then look what He puts in connection with that. Think not. Now what does think not mean? Do not think this. Do not think I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but fulfill. Now stop right there. Some people think Jesus came to fulfill the law and that means he came to do away with it. All right, let's suppose fulfill means do away with. Let me reread this. Do not think I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to do away with it. What's wrong with this picture? What does fulfill mean? If you want to know what a word means in the Bible, what did I tell you opening night? Let the Bible explain itself. Turn back one page. What does fulfill mean? There in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. John recognizes he's in the presence of God incarnate. He says, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus, verse 15, says to him, this is Matthew chapter 3, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Does fulfill mean do away with all righteousness? Or to fill full? That's what fulfill means, to fill full. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fill it up. He came to magnify the law and make it honorable. And that's what he does through his opening message. He takes the commandments one by one. He doesn't destroy them. He broadens them. He says, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whoever looks on the opposite sex to lust has committed adultery in his heart. Did he do away with the commandment or did he magnify it? He said, you've heard it said by them, you shall not kill by them of old. 
But I say unto you, that if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. Did he say it's now okay to murder? Or did he broaden that commandment? He also went on to elaborate and say, do not swear, do not use God's name in vain. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Be honest in all your communications. Jesus went on down through the commandments and he expanded on them because the Ten Commandments are so broad and comprehensive. Do you know that the U.S. government has a law regarding the pricing of cabbage that has over 250,000 words for the pricing of cabbage. And God was able to simplify his will for humanity with these ten simple precepts. The first four dealing with our love relationship with God, the last six dealing with our love relationship with each other. Do you know the Lord's Prayer is divided the same way as the Ten Commandments? The Lord's Prayer has seven petitions. The first 40 percent deal with God. Thy name, thy kingdom. The last 60% deal with our needs. Forgive us our debts. Deliver us. Feed us. This is an expression of God's will. Even the Lord's Prayer is an example of that. Sometimes, I'm not used to that any more than you are. Sometimes I feel like I'm being followed by an alien. Okay, let's all ignore it now. <laughs> Let me read on here. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments. That means you look through the ten, you figure out which one you think is least important. Whoever therefore shall break one of the least of these and teach men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me explain. Jesus is not saying that the people in the kingdom of heaven who taught others to break the commandment will simply be lower on the scale. Jesus is saying the people in the kingdom will speak of the individual who teaches others to break the law as the lowest form of life. They're not going to be in the kingdom. The people in the kingdom will call them least. You got that? Whoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so he'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So friends, if you're upset that Pastor Doug is talking about the law, I'm just doing what Jesus told me to do. He wants me to do them and he wants me to teach them. Whoever does that raises the standard of righteousness in the church. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I think you know that a camera lens is a little impersonal. That's why I want to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, and your comments. We also appreciate your prayer requests. Our office staff gathers every day to pray over each one of them. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, nine five six seven eight god bless you and i thank you in advance will people who knowingly continue to to break even one of god's commandments be saved what does the bible say first of all the penalty for sin is what death the bible says he'll destroy sinners james 2 10 whoever therefore shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all now again i want to reiterate God does not save us because we obey the commandments. We obey the commandments after he saves us. Let me illustrate with a Bible story. Did God first send Moses to the children of Israel why they were slaves? And say, here's my law, keep my law, and I'll get you out of Egypt. Is that what he did? Or was the first step for them to sacrifice a lamb? First they sacrificed the lamb, then they began their journey out. They crossed the Red Sea, they're now free, they're no longer slaves. He gives them bread from heaven, he gives them water from a rock, he gives them victory over their enemies. After he's done all this to show he loves them, he brings them to Mount Sinai, and what's the first commandment? 
What's the first commandment? No other God? Wrong. If you look in Exodus 20, verse 1, here's the first commandment. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have other gods before me. That was on the table of stone. First thing it said was, I am the God that saved you. In other words, I've shown you how I feel about you. I've shown you that I love you. I've shown you I have your best interest in mind. Now, if you love me, here's my law. After they were saved. They were not saved by keeping the law. They kept the law after they were saved. Now, don't miss this point. They were not saved from Egypt because they kept the Ten Commandments. But the wilderness is a halfway point, isn't it? They weren't supposed to be saved from Egypt to the wilderness. They're trying to get from Egypt to the promised land. He brought them to the wilderness to teach them to obey. Those who, after having heard the law of God, refused to obey, did they make it to the promised land? Or did their bodies drop in the wilderness? You are not saved by keeping the law, but as sure as you're alive, you're not going to heaven deliberately breaking it. Because you could not be trusted there. If Satan was cast out for sinning, we're not going in that way. Jesus came to save us from our sin. I believe he's powerful enough to do it, don't you? Question number eight. Can anyone be saved by keeping the law? If we could be saved by keeping the law, Jesus didn't need to die. But that was the only way for us to be saved, was through his sacrifice. Let me see if I can illustrate why this is so important. How many of you have heard the expression before, we're not under the law, but we're under grace? And some people interpret that to mean that not being under the law means you're free to disobey. Well, that's a scary thought. Did Jesus save us so we can sin? Or did he save us from sin? I was invited this year to do a debate. It's called a panel discussion. That's a friendly debate. With uh, three or four other ministers. And it was on TV all around Northern California. And the subject was the law of God. And one of the ministers took the position. He said, uh, well, we can't keep God's commandments. We all know that nobody can obey God. And, of course, I wanted to ask, well, which ones are you breaking? But that wouldn't have been polite. So instead I asked this question. Can the devil tempt us to sin? How many here agree that the devil can get us to break God's law? Can everybody raise your hands. You all know we can all break God's law. All right? We believe the devil's powerful enough to get us to disobey and break God's law. How many of us believe that God is powerful enough to keep us from falling? This guy said no. He said, yes, the devil can tempt us to sin, but God can't keep us from sin. And so in other words, your devil's bigger than your God. There's a lot of people out there that believe that. Well, we're all human, you know, and, and of course someone's going to say, well, who's perfect? We always like to do that. But what I'm telling you is the law is a perfect standard. If you lower the standard to what everybody's doing, it just keeps on going down to the lowest common denominator. That's what's happening in our society. I've got a lot more I can share with you on this that will be in future studies, but I need to, to move along here. Number nine. Why then is the law an absolute essential for perfecting Christian character? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, back during the days of the Civil War, North was fighting with the South, and uh, they used to have a standard bearer who bore the, the number of the company and whether they fought with the North or the South on a flag. And these were brave characters because they went into battle holding a stick with a flag on it, no gun. Their job was to put the standard down and mark the territory that their forces had occupied. Whenever their flag was in a position, it meant their force, their company, their regiment had occupied that territory. And during one very fierce battle, um, during the time of Gettysburg, one of the standard bearers was following his men up the hill as they were trying to take possession of this hill from the, the south under murderous fire. And, and the soldiers from the north were dropping like flies and the standard bearer made it up as far as his front lines made it and he planted the standard and pretty soon they began to retreat and all of the northern soldiers went back down the hill under this fire and they shouted to the standard bearer they said bring the standard back down here he said no way he said you bring the battle back up where the standard is and you know what's happening now is people are being told 
in order to reach more people for the church, the church is supposed to lower the standard of the world to make it easier for the world to get in the church. And God is saying, no, you're supposed to bring the world up to where I am. That's the purpose of the church. We're not supposed to lower the standard. As soon as we stop talking about the law of God, church just becomes bingo. It just becomes potlucks and social activities. It doesn't talk about salvation from sin and victory and new life and deliverance. That's the danger of getting away from God's law. Number 10. What enables a truly converted Christian to follow the pattern of God's law? I will put my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. When God's law is in the heart, now that's the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. You know where you find the new covenant? In the Old Testament. The new covenant is, I will write my law in their hearts. I will cause them to walk in my ways. The old covenant was the law written on stone. The Lord says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel after those days. I'll put my law in their hearts and write them in their minds. How does God get his law in our heart? When we see how much Jesus loves us, love has a, a transforming power. When you really fall in love with somebody, you want to please them. You want to do everything you can to make them happy. There's an old drunk married to a very nice Christian lady. And he would stay late at the saloon. This is many years ago. Every night he lived in one of these Midwest towns. And she was always so polite. And the drunks got together one night at the saloon and they were all bragging about this and that. And then they started bragging about their wives. And this old character said, you guys just be quiet because I've got the best wife and there's no comparison. He said, oh, no, I got the best wife. Oh, my wife can do this. He said, all right, come with me. And he grabbed two or three of his drunk friends and they went stumbling down the street to this man's house. Well, it's already past midnight and they all stormed inside. Now, the man's wife was a Christian. She had been very patient. She was converted after their marriage and was a true Christian. Loved her husband, kind to him in spite of the abusive behavior. He stumbled in the house and started shouting upstairs, Honey, come on down. She woke up, got her robe on, came downstairs. Said, My friends came over, uh, get us something to eat. She said, Give me a few minutes. And she went in the kitchen and uh, started whipping something up. And one by one, these guys sitting around the table were sobering up. And they thought, This is really rude. What are we doing? And they said, uh, I got to go. You win. Your wife's the best wife. Pretty soon she came out of the kitchen. She's got this platter of food. And her husband was sitting there at the table with his head in his hands and he was sobbing. And she said, what's the matter, dear? He said, why are you so good to me? He said, I'm so mean to you and you're so good to me. You're so kind and so patient. How come? And she said, honey, a few years ago I became a Christian and I now have everlasting life. And I've got joy and it's tough sometimes here, but I'm going to live forever in a world where there's no more pain. She said, but you're lost, and the only happiness you're ever going to have is this life, and I'm just trying to make you as happy as I can make you. <laughs> and it broke his heart, and he became a Christian. It was her love that did it. You know, that's, that's the power of Jesus. His love makes us want to obey. The Ten Commandments are summed up in, love the Lord, love your neighbor. You've got two arms. Your two arms are not as productive without the fingers. The way you demonstrate love to God is through those first commandments. The way you demonstrate love to your neighbor is through the last commandments. Love is the fulfilling of the law. When we really have love for God in our hearts, you're not going to kill or steal. How many of you have children? How come you don't kill your children? No, let me tell you, because you'll be thrown in jail. The reason you don't kill your children is because there's a law that says don't kill your children. Isn't that right? You know, there's some people that do it in spite of the law. How many of you ever think, well, I'd sure like to dispatch with my child, but I'd probably get thrown in jail? Most of us, hopefully all of us, don't even consider the law, do we? There is a law that says don't kill your children, and there is a penalty for that law, but that law doesn't bother us because we love our children. We don't even think about it. When you love, it's automatic. That's how it is with all of God's commandments when we really love Him. And you know what? If you could see Jesus on your cross suffering for your sins... The crown, the spear, the nails, the whip,
the beating was all belonging to you and me, but he loved you and me so much, he said, I don't want you to suffer, I'll take it for you. And when you find out that it was real, that he really did that for you, when you have faith in his sacrifice, it empowers you to love him back and stop doing the things that hurt him. The Bible says when we sin, we crucify him afresh, and it hurts the Lord. Number 11, isn't a Christian who has found, has faith, and is living under grace free from keeping the law? Didn't Jesus die so that we're no longer under the law but under grace? And doesn't under grace mean that we no longer obey? No. Under grace means that you're no longer under the penalty of the law. When you come to Jesus, you're under the penalty of the law. The penalty is sin. When you accept Jesus, you're no longer under the death penalty. You're now standing on the law. It's your foundation. You're under grace. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. I was driving in uh, Ukiah, California, and uh, I was going a little too fast. And you know, I'm a really deep thinker, so much so that I passed a highway patrolman. No, I don't mean I passed him while he was on the side of the road. I passed him while he was in the other lane. <laughs> and pretty soon the lights came on, and he pulled me over. And uh, you know what the ladies start to do? They start to cry. I tried that once. And she didn't give me a ticket. <laughs> the lady policeman. Anyway, uh, the fellow pulled me over. And he said, you know, uh, you weren't going that fast, but I was following somebody. And it felt kind of stupid when you passed me. <laughs> and I said, oh, officer, can you please have mercy? I said, are you guys allowed to have mercy? I said, I was just on a highway where it was 65, and I wasn't thinking. And, and our insurance rates will go up. I've got a good record. And, and pretty soon he said, all right, I believe you're telling the truth. Uh, tell you what, I'll pay your ticket for you. <laughs> Just kidding. He said, uh, we'll forget about it. Now, I was under the law when he pulled me over because I broke the law. As soon as he said, we'll forget about it, I am now not under the law anymore. I'm under grace, which of course means that as soon as I walk back to my car, I rev my engine. I put it in second, I popped the clutch, I peeled away spraying dirt and gravel everywhere because now I'm under grace, I can go 90. Is that what I did? No. No. When, uh, when he said, you're free to go, and now I'm under grace instead of the law, I put my blinker on, I looked both ways. I pulled out slowly and I went 52 and a half miles an hour because I'm under grace now. When a person's under grace, they are more careful than anybody to obey because they're a new creature now, right? We're Christians. We're demonstrating what God is like. He doesn't save us in sin, but from sin. Number 12. Are the Ten Commandments of God reaffirmed in the New Testament? Are they? Yes. You do not find one of the commandments you do not really find very clearly. The commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You don't really find that word for word in the New Testament, but the principle's there. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Isn't that the same principle? And again, it says, You should not blaspheme the name and the doctrine of God. So you, in principle, find all the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Number 13. Are God's law and Moses' law the same? What's the answer? First of all, Moses brought the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, but it's the law that God spoke and God wrote. There were two distinct laws. The law of Moses was written on paper. God's law was written on stone. Moses' law was put on a side of the Ark of the Covenant. God's Ten Commandment law was put in the Ark. Moses' law was written by Moses. God's law written by God's finger. Moses' law came after sin. God's law existed even before sin. See what I'm saying? Moses' law revolved around the temple and its sanctuary and they were shadows and types. And when the veil ripped from top to bottom, it passed away. God's law is not just for a certain race of people, it's for all people everywhere. It's an expression of His very character. Number 14. How does the devil feel about people who pattern their lives after the Ten Commandments? What does it say? Revelation chapter 12. The dragon is wroth with the woman now this is a woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, stars above her head, the light of the world. God said to the church, you are the light of the world. The dragon is wroth with this woman. And what are her characteristics? She keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. 
Now, there's two things you can do to be sure you're doing the right thing. One is do the things that make God happy. The other that's almost just as good is do whatever makes the devil mad. If it makes the devil mad, then you're probably doing the right thing. Am I right? Is the devil mad at people that obey God? Yeah, then you're probably doing the right thing. The devil's got the rest of the world disobeying. And God can enable you and I to obey. And number 15, do you believe it is essential for a Christian to obey the Ten Commandments? Friends, when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. The very fact that the cup did not pass was because there was no other way. Jesus died for our what? What is sin? Transgression of the law. Jesus died for our disobeying His law. To not only forgive us, but to empower us to be new creatures. And I believe my God is powerful enough to enable us because of love for Him to do His will. Do you believe that? I pray your answer is yes.